easily 90%, maybe more than that, can come off them with type 2 diabetes, can get off the medication, become non-diabetic. And it's not only having beta cell reserve left, it's also reclaiming some non-functioning beta cells that are hibernating due to inflammation. How do I be satisfied with the right amount of calories? And how do I eat instinctually so the amount of calories and food I desire is the right amount? Why should, you, why should there be a, a, you know, a disconnect between the amount what you feel like eating and what's best for your body? It should be the same. Right. So we're trying to inspire people to be happier in general, to appreciate the world around them. And we notice that when a person becomes more food addicted or addicted to drugs or smoking or whatever, the addictive substances drive their behavior and makes them less ability to relate to the outside world and less caring and less passionate and less because they're driven by their desire to meet their need for addictive substances which overtakes their desire to be useful to the um to the external world welcome back to another episode of the proof i'm simon hill your show host today's guest is dr joel Furman. dr Furman is a board certified family physician and seven time new york times best-selling author he coined the term nutritarian to describe a nutrient-dense eating style designed to prevent cancer, slow aging, and extend lifespan. In this conversation, we talk about many important things related to nutrition, including the benefits of eating more plant protein and unsaturated fats, why an animal-based diet is probably not a good idea for long-term health, and why vegans should consider supplementing with a DHA, EPA, algae oil. While Dr. Furman and I might not completely agree on everything, for example, I tend to think that higher protein plant-based diets are a good thing and am not convinced by the protein restriction studies in animals, the majority of the big picture things like eating more whole plants and less animal and ultra processed foods, we do agree on. And I actually think that it's important to have people on who don't see things exactly the same as myself. It's more fun that way. It keeps me more honest. And I think it's better for you guys as listeners too. Before we get into the episode, a quick reminder to please subscribe on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you're tuning in from. Your support is greatly appreciated and enormously important to this show finding its way into the ears of more people. And now my conversation with Dr. Joel Furman. So tell me, what was the nutritarian breakfast this morning? What was on the menu? Well, we ate in the car <laughs> coming here. Well, thank you for, yeah. for driving up. So you're based in San Diego? San Diego, yeah. Right, okay. So I threw some stuff into a bowl um, with a cover on it the, last night. Okay. I threw like oats, wild blueberries. I had a little raisins in there, a little mango, a little blue um, blackberries i just threw i had some quinoa in there i just threw a bunch of stuff in it flax seeds chia seeds hemp seeds i just threw a bunch of stuff in a bowl and let it sit in unsweetened soy milk so it got soft overnight and i also had a box of blueberries in the car and i had a to uh, i had a um a dehydrated tofu square like i took this extra firm tofu dehydrated tofu it's square. most incredible i take this extra firm tofu and i slice it into five layers i put it in a dehydrator for 20 hours but i put a lot of tomato sauce on tomato sauce on top of it i mix tomato sauce with tomato paste i put a little bit of my thai curry sauce and a little bit of mustard in there too and i put this thick coating on the dried tofu and i dehydrated it at 125 degrees for 20 hours so i had like this concentrated hard chewy like beef jerky thing to chew on in the car. It's like fun to eat. Right. You know? Yeah. I think people think healthy food has to, mm. has to taste awful. <laughs> so it's <laughs> nice to know that, that it can be done in a way where it's still delicious. Yeah. And yeah. you want to give you like jaw something to chew on, like strengthens your teeth and gums, mm. you know? So I think, like, I think some people though may listen to that and think that sounds really time consuming. Sometimes what? Very time consuming. Like a lot of effort went into making that. No, I made it. Well, you, you, once you, it took me like five minutes to slice. I made the sauce, put some ingredients in, you know, mixed it up, laid it on top, and put in the dehydrator. Turn the dehydrator on. You let it come back the next day, and it's done. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's five minutes. Yeah. And the moral of the story, I think, for from your breakfast sounds like being prepared was key, because it would be easy to get in the car and drive past how many fast food places I imagine, right, that are selling all sorts of seductive food, right? 
Well, it's not seductive to me. I mean, I wouldn't even think of eating that stuff. It's that's like saying, if a drug addict's on the street, I'll be tempted to go and buy a cigar or some heroin. Or you know, it's obviously I, I see the food most people eat as just um, sadly self-destructive. Mm. Yeah, but I imagine though for the for the typical person who's trying to change their diet, though that preparation is probably pretty critical. Absolutely. You know, a person who's a food addict, they purposely don't prepare. And it's a kind of subconscious way the mind works. They'll purposely get to an airport with no food packed up because that way gives them an excuse to have the bagels, the cookies, the pizza. And they say, oh, there's nothing to eat. I can't starve. I got to go off my diet. Because you could see that's like a food addict, a typical person with food addiction sets them up for fail, sets themselves up for failure. Where the, um, and the subconscious mind isn't thinking of setting themselves up for failure. They just go without being prepared. You know so what do you think the keys are to set someone, to set yourself up for success if, and I appreciate as this conversation unfolds, we're going to talk about what to eat, but starting here with perhaps what is equally as important, if not more, <laughs> how to do it and, and do it in a way that's sustainable, what is critical to, to success? Um, first thing is you have to eat a lot of food. You have to eat a, a lot of food volume. If you don't eat food, you're going to be tempted to eat things that are not healthy. So by having, particularly eating foods that sustain you for many hours and feel satisfied with that meal, and the satisfaction or satiety index of that meal can be enhanced by mixing together various foods, like having green vegetables, um, some nuts and seeds, some beans, even some whole grains like quinoa, a comprehensive meal, not with excessive amount of calories, but with a good combination of foods and some fruit for dessert that satisfies you and sustains you for many hours. So you don't feel like snacking, you don't feel like eating. So the one thing is you can't control your, your caloric drive unless you satisfy your nutrient drive. And nutrients include fiber, phytochemicals, antioxidants. So we're satisfying people's nutrient drive adequately. So it lessens their total caloric drive, makes them satisfied with fewer calories. Right. I want to come back, revisit this idea of satiety as we kind of move through this. But I guess what you're speaking to as well kind of describes the problem with consuming a lot of ultra processed foods that are low in fiber and phytochemicals and water all that stuff then then you become you can't control your caloric um, desires you become you get you disrupt the body's need for energy and its feedbacks all the neuropeptides and neural hormones that tell you how much to eat are completely disrupted and you try to tra crave more calories you desire because you're not containing foods that contain nutrients in them and of course I, t I very often lecture and speak about the caloric load in the bloodstream. That if you lived, you know, 50,000 years ago, you're eating things that are grown at nature, at natural foods, and the food takes some time to digest. You eat a nut, you eat a vegetable, you eat a salamander, whatever it is, and it takes time for the body to break those foods down. But in current society, we can eat things that are fried or oily or greasy or been cooked or, or made into fine particles like flours, and they could be absorbed in the bloodstream very rapidly. So you get a huge caloric hit in the bloodstream that you couldn't get. It would, you couldn't get more than 100 calories at a time into a bloodstream. But when you're, putting, when you're fr eat, eating oil and animal fats and sweets and flours, you can get 400, 500 calories in the bloodstream at one time. And that high caloric load in the bloodstream stimulates hormonal centers of the brain, both the dopamine and opiate receptors, cannabinoid receptors. In other words, we're talking here about um, making the body dopamine insensitive and making you no, no longer comfortable with normal amounts of calories. You need hyper amounts of calories. You get acclimated to it, you get addicted to it, and you'd feel um, unsatisfied unless you hit the, bot, the body with an extra high caloric load at one time. Yeah, which sounds kind of counterintuitive to people, right? Because they have an excess of calories, but they're just as hungry, if not more hungry. Yes. That, that it's break, not real hunger, right? You know, but, they're, but an apple doesn't satisfy them. Having some vegetables, they need something with a more caloric concentration, with a bigger caloric hit, and they're really an addictive eater. They're not, a, eating, they're not eating for nutrients or, or energy. They're eating to meet their addictive drives now because the brain gets stimulated with these, with these hyper-palatable and hyper-caloric foods. That rate of, of nutrients hitting the, the bloodstream and the sort of uh, gastric emptying, is, is fiber the biggest way to kind of put a break on that, slow that down? Yes, that's true, is that foods that have a lot of fiber, that have fiber, natural foods that contain fiber, slow the entry 
of carbohydrate or glucose into the bloodstream. When you eat beans, for example, beans are very high in what's called slowly digestible carbohydrates or slowly digestible starches that take many hours to break down. And they have resistant starch as well, which doesn't get broken down by enzymes. It gets broken down by bacteria that ferment it, which takes many hours. And most of those resistant starches pass through into the toilet bowl and never even come into the body. But yes, the to absorb the carbohydrates in beans takes hours, which is why they have a low glycemic load because you don't have a glucose spike in the blood. But when you eat something like white rice or white flour, bread, bagels, pizza, you know, burger buns, sandwiches, then the white flour breaks down at the, almost instantaneously entering the bloodstream at the same speed as had you eaten sugar, just had sugar cubes or honey. So the glucose, so there's almost a biological equivalent between sugar and white flour which I don't even consider that a food. It enters the bloodstream so rapidly with no nutrients that it's really like a drug. What are the main foods that people might be eating that contain white flour that perhaps they're not aware of? Well, they're eating cold cereals, which are highly processed carbohydrates. They're eating pasta, which is made of white flour. And when you pick a bread where it says wheat flour, that's white flour. It says wheat flour. It has to say whole wheat flour to not be white flour. But, but in any case, white flour is, you know, I call it... Um, you know, it enters the bloodstream, and because it, the body can't convert it into energy efficiently, because it doesn't contain cofactors, vitamins and minerals, and, and the phytochemicals that diffuse the production of reactive oxygen species during digestion, that the body more shunts it more to fat storage. So it's an inefficient producer of energy. So it's shunted more to fat storage, and because it's producing energy inefficiently, it leaves people over, overall still feeling fatigued, even though they had an adequate amount of calories. Does it frustrate you that it's common for the term carbohydrates to kind of be simplified, given that not all carbohydrates are equal? That's, that's correct. You can't talk about a high carbohydrate diet, a low carbohydrate. It's all irrelevant. It's the type of carbohydrate, not the term carbohydrate. It's fine to eat carbohydrates if they're not these highly glycemic processed carbohydrates. You've been doing this for, what, 30 years now, maybe more? <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Um, it's a long time in the game. I'm 69. Mm. So let's see. I started doing this when I was like 12 to 15 years old. You know, wow. so that's pretty a lot. Of Where did work. that interest come from? Mostly from my father who was overweight and sickly and who had many medical problems. And he started reading Dr. Shelton, Herbert Shelton's books in the night that were written in the 1950s, I think. Um, so I was, and I used to, he used to read some of these books and tell me about what he's learning. And I would say, that's ridiculous. How could that be right and everybody else in the world be wrong? How could you be right? And how could this guy say things that are true when everything else is wrong? You think these diseases are reversible and nobody has to have asthma and high blood pressure and diabetes and they're reversible and conditions. And, 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 but so as I, with skepticism, investigated it more and, and he introduced these healthy foods to the house and I saw him transform his health and get better. Um, and then being exposed to people who recovered their health in my teenage years and going, starting to go to some health conferences that advocated that, I learned more about it and got interested in that. So the time I was in my mid-20s and finished my career as a, as a um, competitive figure skater, I started to think about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And at that point, because you, you might know I was um, um, second in the United States in Paris figure skating in 1973. That's many years ago. And then, so in 19, after the 1976 Olympics and the 1976 World Professional Champions, I was third in the World Professional Championship in 1976. And then I decided to just do professional skating. In those days, you couldn't do amateur competitions once you started accepting money and did professional comp events and professional shows. So I went into professional skating and then went into my family's shoe business. My father had a chain of shoe stores. But as I was doing that, I realized that wasn't my real passion. My passion was really this, how excited I was about nutritional excellence being therapeutically possible for people to reverse disease. Nutritional excellence. Yeah, so I've that- I've heard you say that before. Nutritional excellence is therapeutically powerful, not just to make you live longer, but to reverse diseases so people can recover from asthma and recover from headaches and recover from high blood pressure, diabetes, reverse heart disease, get well from psoriasis. And so the therapeutic potential to have a tool that can make people get well again excited me. And I decided then to um, go back to medical school, to go back to the postgraduate pre-medical program because I, I graduated from college in 1976 and I did not have the 
pre-medical science and math requirements. I hadn't taken calculus. I hadn't taken the biology and physics and biochemistry, you know, all the, um, that you needed to take. So I went back to the postgraduate pre-med program at Columbia with the, uh, with the specific intent to leave my father's business, to sell it so he can retire, and I would go back to school to become a physician specializing in nutrition. Right. And today, still just as passionate, enthusiastic, and inspired with everything that you're doing? Yeah, it was a pretty good, good decision back then. It's been a very, very um, rewarding career. Um, and I didn't know what would happen to me in those days. I figured, you know, you don't know what percent of people would like this type of care. I knew it would always be a niche. But I've never known I've had the opportunities I've had to be on television in America, to have my own shows on public television, to reach millions of people and have, you know, I never knew I'd have this so much opportunity. But of course, it really, um, you know, gives me a tremendous amount of satisfaction just to deal with individuals and, and help them get well. And even if it's one person, it could be a hundred people or a thousand people or a million people. But even if you help some people, it gives you a good feeling, you know? Do you remember your days at medical school and the, I guess, the curriculum? I mean, you kind of sound like you went into it already with this appreciation for the power of lifestyle. But often we hear uh, about medical degrees that there is a, a lack of emphasis on on lifestyle and there's much more focus on uh, drugs and different medical interventions. No. What, what was your experience like? No emphasis, no information on, on what you can do to help people get healthy. You know, they didn't even talk about it. sleep, exercise, positive mental outlook, good nutrition. Those things were completely ignored in medical school. You know, there was some lectures on like the biochemistry of vitamin B6 and riboflavin and, 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 and vitamin deficiency diseases like scurvy, but that doesn't, that's not really practicing how you can take people, educate, motivate them, and facilitate their change to get healthier. None of that was ever discussed. It was all just, um, you know, surgical techniques, pharmacologic med methods, and really hospital medicine. What, what doctors or... Uh, academics or books what was I guess inspiring you where were you going to get that information given it wasn't necessarily in your curriculum correct yeah. not in the curriculum at all well in medical school I still wrote papers on what nutrition could do and I submitted them for review by scientists and researchers at the school you know they set me up at University of Pennsylvania where I went to medical school they knew I had an interest in the in lifestyle and nutritional nutritional excellence. So I asked them for mentors and doctors who had like interests at the medical school that I could communicate with and hang out with. And I and they had a research department there, a research scientist in the nutrition field. And I did visit, communicate with them and showed them some of my writings. And we had you know, casual discussions outside of the tr um, traditional curriculum while I was there. And I did find some like-minded individuals there, including like-minded students. They made me, by the way, they made me chairperson of the nutritional education department at University of Pennsylvania while I was a medical student there. And they also put me on the school's admission committee. They weren't um, negative to my um, career interests. They were supportive of it. They would say, whatever you're interested in, as long as you represent our school being the best at what you do, then we're for it. You know what I mean? So they helped. But, but I think most of my research and collection of information was done by extensive review of many thousands of research articles as well as over the years, my clinical experience, but I must have reviewed 30,000 scientific articles on human nutrition. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Most of the information I collected over the years was probably from just reviewing the scientific literature. I've had reviewed, spent a huge amount of time reviewing probably more than 30,000 scientific articles on human nutrition, culling and cultivating the best, most important ones, and recognizing that they lead to a certain conclusion that, which shows a lot of corroboration. And it's not, because most people think, you know, one study contradicts another, but really when you review the full um, science of nutritional science that's available, you see the evidence becomes overwhelming. Right. Has your views of nutrition, um, even if in a small way, how have they evolved from, from that 
period, so 30-odd years ago when you were first thinking about this. Right. Since then, there's been even more research that's been published. Oh, so yeah. in what ways has your thinking about food and how it affects human physiology and health perhaps changed or been updated over that time? Well, there's a tremendous amount of learning and also clinical experience dealing with people with specific conditions and how you might modify a healthy diet to meet the needs of these individuals with medical problems. That may be designing a diet for a person with renal insufficiency or a person with ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease that might be different from you just give every other healthy person a diet. So it's, and then what kind of supplements and adjunctive therapies can be useful for a person, including things like depression that doesn't involve nutrition or what kind of supplements might be useful. But I think if you're looking about some of the major changes in the nutrition field over the last three decades, when I started in the 1980s, right when I we came when I graduated from medical school and started in this field um, in the 1980s, I think it would be the fact that I became a doctor that attracted a lot of the people who were already in the plant-based community and people who were already eating a healthy life. And so, but at, at, at half, it's taking care of people with significant and, and serious medical conditions, and other people seeing the deterioration of people on plant-based diets with neurological problems in later life for, that I saw in my career. Like for example, um, many of my mentors and people who I um, looked up to who were on healthy vegan diets, in those days, the society was called the American Natural Hygiene Society, that's now called National Health Association, where people were advocating this healthy plant-based but whole food diet that Dr. Shelton started in the 1950s that my father keyed onto his books. Describe so, that diet for, for people that maybe haven't heard of it. Was it a very low fat, like low total fat plant-based diet or what did it look like? No, the fat intake was not the major factor, but, the, but they weren't eating processed foods. They were getting their fats from nuts and seeds. You know, they would eat almonds and walnuts but it was mostly natural foods, plant-based natural food people who, were, who really um, knew and lived the life of the so-called natural hygienist, leading, living a natural life. And you would think these people would generally live a long time as they claimed it would happen and not develop heart disease and strokes and cancers, which was true. But many of them, as they aged, developed neurologic problems like Parkinson's disease and mental issues like dementia. And to my surprise and chagrin, I was, you know, searching and look, making sure what's the problem here? Why did they, they live longer than the average American, but sometimes they didn't live longer. Sometimes they got Parkinson's at a young age. And so, the, so what happened to my um, information was actually doing a blood work, extensive blood work on all these elderly vegans, many of which I saw in my practice, who were older than me and living not on a junk food plant-based diet, but on a very healthy plant-based vegan diet and recognizing some of these deficiencies that could arise on a vegan diet. So we're talking about things like omega-3s. We're talking about predominantly about omega-3. We're talking about in those days, they knew about B12. Even back in the 1960s, they knew B12 was hard to find and people were taking B12 supplements. So it wasn't due to B12 deficiency and these individuals who developed either Parkinson's or dementia dementia, it was not because of B12 deficiency. And don't forget, most dementia in the standard American eating, the regular population, is caused by lack of phytochemicals of the brain, atherosclerosis, cholesterol, and fat. In other words, high it's not- High blood pressure. High blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. Most dementia is caused by the standard American diet, the poor diet. So these were people eating an excellent diet. So they did not have- They, they would have had great cardiometabolic health. Great cardiometabolic health, they had good um, nutrient levels. So the question is, why do they develop these issues? Where was the gap? Where was the gap? So you think that DHA, EPA, which otherwise in a diet would be found from eating fish, you think that was the main gap? That was the main gap, was the omega-3 index. When I drew the omega-3 index on these elderly vegans who had medical conditions, that neurological conditions, their levels were almost um, routinely very low. Some were almost undetectably low. What do you like to get that up to? What percentage? Well, if you ask me what I've changed in recent years, um, the Nutritional Research Foundation supported a study done about 10 years ago where we checked the, the omega-3 index of 100, about 150, I think it was 160 vegans. And we found the majority of them, about 66% have levels below four. Because I used to think that it's better to have your level be above four. 
for for maximizing brain size and brain health. But in the but since then, in the last decade, we've seen more studies to show um, increased lifespan, lower risk of inflammation from xenobiotics, which are toxic compounds like pesticides and chemicals that can damage the brain, more protection against chemical damage to the brain, and more protection against cognitive impairment and shrinkage of the brain with levels above five and above six. So I've moved gradually over the years to recommending people take their levels um, supplement accordingly to keep their levels above four. And then I changed it to five. And now I'm trying for myself and other people I'm advising to have their omega-3 index be above six. And how, for the average person, what dose do you think is required to get from 4%? If someone's listening now and they're yes. thinking, oh, I've been following that style plant-based diet for a decade or a couple of decades, but I haven't been taking DHA, EPA. Right. So maybe they're at 4% or lower right. and they want to get to six or a little bit higher. Right. What dosage are, the, are we thinking? I don't know that answer because there's such a strong genetic factor in your ability to convert the ALA from flax seeds, walnuts, and greens into EPA and then DHA. The conversion is very poor for most people. They don't convert very well. But some people do convert adequately. I've seen people take no supplements and have levels of seven or eight. And I'm shocked they take so. In other words, the dose is dependent on individual need. And, some, and, and of course, um, the supplement that I developed which um, has about 250 milligrams of EPA and DHA, and it gets most people in that favorable range, but it still leaves about a third of individuals requiring a little bit extra than the standard dose, you know what I mean? It gets most people in that standard range. So, uh, so mo mostly we recommend about, if you add up the DHA and EPA together, about 250 for most people gets them up to above, you know, above 5.5 or above six. That conversion difference, the genetic, I guess, differences that exist out there. Yeah. Is that likely a, re a result of whether your ancestors were eating fish or not? So perhaps if they weren't eating any fish, you have a better conversion rate. You can convert more ALA to DHA and EPA. I'd be guessing, you know, I, I it's could, a theory. It's a theory. I wouldn't know, really know the answer to that question, but um, there's a lot of genetic variabilities. There's a lot of genetic variabilities with the utilization of zinc and copper, a lot of genetic variabilities with the utilization of people as they know with um, B12 and methylation of, uh, and you're, whether you're, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of individual differences that to be a physician that has the ability to really help an individual who's not thriving, you have to be able to inquire, examine, and even test to see what has to be changed in this person's program to make sure they thrive and get well. And that's what you learn through many decades of experience, you know. I supplement with DHA, EPA from algae oil myself. Have you checked your omega-3 index to see I'm where? I'm about to measure it this week. Okay. Found a company here in the States. I couldn't, couldn't find one in, in Australia, but I'm, I'm interested to see where it's at. Because you have to take the, that dose you're taking right now for at least three months, preferably four months, and then check it because it takes... Um, because the red blood cells have a 120-day half-life. Sure, yeah. So they have to circulate around enough so they can reflect what you're taking. And then you can see if the levels, what the level is, if you need to take a little more or a little less. Right. You know, you know? Yeah, I think that's a good way for people to navigate it. Yeah. It's a very objective way, which considers your genetics and whatever dose you're taking. Right. I've been taking that daily for, gosh, five plus years. Okay. So more than long enough to, you're probably good. to get an accurate kind of yeah. um, measurement there. Why do you think... I mean, this is still not accepted by everyone. There are some people within the plant-based community that may argue against this position and say, you don't need DHA, EPA. Is, is more studies required, do you think, to get everyone on board? Or no. can you argue their position? Do you see their position that no. they would be taking? Not really. I think it's a... Um, you know, you have radicalism on all, on all for, um, fields. In other words... We have many people that think it's good to eat a diet of all meat. And no matter how many studies we present, we're not going to change their mind about, about a diet of eating a, a meat diet or a paleo diet or a keto diet. You know, we have a lot of evidence showing cumulative the last five years of those keto and paleo diets, high meat diets, being dangerous. But that's not going to change these people's mind because they can find some information they can cling to that supports what they want to eat and what they want to think. And there are many people in the plant-based movements that have been indoctrinated like a religion and for them, it's a philosophy, not a science. They're not flexible in changing their viewpoint with accum new accumulating evidence. They'll look for any pearl, any information they can to justify their prior viewpoints. And I think they're 
um, philosophically, I think they want to hail the purity of the, of the vegan or the plant-based diet and not to admit or realize this might be some flaws or weaknesses potentially in it. So I think they'd be resistant. I don't think more evidence would be helpful because there's been that degree of evidence has already been presented. There's been so many studies that corroborate each, each other so that the credence is extremely high at this point. By credence, we mean that when a study is done with a large number of people and followed for, for a lot, long period of time, and you see a certain outcome, well, then you see the other studies corroborate that and show the same thing. And how many studies are necessary for you to think it's valuable? 10, three, four, five, 10? Are there outlying studies that show otherwise? You know, so we're saying here that they're making arguments that are illogical. Like they'll say things like, well, vegans don't have more dementia than people who are um, on a standard diet. So why would we think vegans that are low on omega-3 would have be a cause of dementia? Because that's another irrelevant argument because of course vegans don't have more dementia because the standard American diets have much more causes of dementia. The but question is, do, could they do better again? Yeah, yeah so it's irrelevant. So even if, and even if it was five out of 100 that got dementia, you still wouldn't even want them to get dementia. We want to protect those five out of 100. That whole argument is, um, so the arguments they give or, or, um, oh, it takes so long for the DHA to enter the brain, or it takes, you know, or you give people with advanced dementia a drug, it doesn't show benefit. They're missing the whole point. It's not, and they're, they're going to try to focus on an argument and convince themselves or their followers who are, you know, who have their, you know, almost like religious zeal for the viewpoint of whoever they want to follow. And it's, and there's very, you know, you have to have a, um, a mind that, or a, purpose to be able to weigh evidence it's like politics people can't weigh evidence and weigh science they're too based on their predetermined biases and i'm saying at this point it's quite um irresponsible to be able to take risk with people's brains and to try to convince them that they should ignore being low on a blood test in a nutrient that's linked to shrinkage of the brain you know, how, we have so many studies that show that low levels are linked to shrinkage of the brain and cognitive impairment. You're just going to tell your followers to ignore those studies and just, and just be comfortable with a low level. To me, that's just irresponsible. If you can't convince those people, what can you do? You do the best I'm you can. I'm with you. I think yeah. that the best thing you can do is point out limitations yeah. of a diet to help people navigate that and optimize their diet yeah. and improve those health outcomes as best as they can. Is there any risk? Are there any adverse effects or risks with supplementation of DHA, EPA? Um, not in the type of dosing we're talking about. There is with people taking high dose fish oils. You know, so in other words, a fish oil capsule can be a gram and some people can take three or four grams a day to thin their blood or to lower their triglycerides and some cardiologists recommend and prescribe that. But you have some potential risks with taking such high dosages. Um, but not, and that's more of a pharmacologic dose looking to lower, and not in a nutritive dose that we're talking about to keep your level between six and nine, let's say. So the answer is no, that the more recent, more comprehensive studies have shown that being in that adequate window of DHA in, intake actually also is linked to all-cause increases in mortality, all-cause decreased mortality and all-cause increases in longevity, so that having a a higher level is linked to lower rates of cancer and lower rates of heart, disease, heart attacks and, of course, protection of the brain. So you live longer in general and you have less, more resilience to toxic toxins from the environment with a higher level. That doesn't mean with any nutrient, like vitamin D, low levels may be, benef may be harmful, but excess amounts could be harmful. I mentioned that in one of my books. I showed studies that low levels of DHA were linked to atrial fibrillation in the blood, but levels get too high, they can actually increase the risk of atrial fibrillation with too high a level as well. There's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot, yes, for every new, for almost all nutrients. The Okinawans, traditional Okinawans, their omega-3 index is about eight to 10%, somewhere in that ballpark. And they seem to do pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say though that the blue zones and the Okinawans and the other blue zones are not examples of optimal health. And they don't have optimal human lifespans because their diet is just socially and culturally, what's, and what's foods indigenous to that area and what they've lived on culturally, because we can design a diet with features that are more, have more scientific integrity to really maximally slow aging and promote, um, push that envelope of human longevity. So I'm suggesting that my experience has been um, 
that we that humans should be able to live between 97 and 107 years old with predictable with, if they have enough periods of their life enough decades of living healthy living and and i'm saying this from my experience taking care of elderly people who follow this way of life and haven't lived this way since birth but in any case in most of the blue zones they're only getting six to eight years of extended lifespan not the you know 15 to 18 years of extended lifespan that i'm talking about what about the potentially adventists? possible how much extra life do the adventists get they get around eight to ten years as well and, and, and I know from living and, and being and visiting and spending time with them, a lot of them are not eating ideally just because they're on plant-based diets. And of course, as you know, the Adventists are such a great group to study because some of them are vegans and some are near vegans, flexitarians, pescatarians, ovo lacto, and some eat animal products in small amounts. So you can study a lot of different cohorts doing different things and compare the two. So the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study too. And all the data they've published, I consider the gold standard of excellent research that we can learn a lot from. Why do you think that the pescatarians in the latest study I've seen from AHS2, mm -hmm. they seem to do the best in terms of lifespan? Does mm -hmm. that come back to, to DHA EPA, you think? Yes. So the, the question is, that leads to an a good question. If DHA is so important, then what's better to have a little seafood or fish in your diet or to just take a supplement? And I'm suggesting that at this point in my career, um, I think it's much more, it's much safer to take a supplement than to eat fish. It might have been the case 20, 30 years ago, um, but now we have so much runoff from farming, from commercial farming, so much algae bloom in, in waterways and oceans and, and estuaries, so much overgrowth of cyanobacteria, so much dumping of plastics. There's this compound called BMAA, which has infiltrated the population of, of, of bivalves. Bivalves are oysters, mussels, scallops, and clams, right? And shellfish like lobster and, and crabs, the bottom feeders, that have, higher, that have such high levels of BMAA that they're actually showing clustering of ALS and higher risk of Parkinson dementia, um, PDS, Parkinson dementia syndrome. That's in, been published? That's been published. That's wow. linked to people in, that live near lakes or near estuaries that were eating more, eating more bivalves. Is that, is that farmed and wild? Farmed and wild, yes. Interesting. I'd love to yeah. read that. Yeah. So even I'm saying that compared to fish, that these bivalves are more dangerous potentially to the brain and to the neurologic and to being poisoned. Super to, interesting. Yeah. So, so given the plastic compounds, so I used to think that, you know, big fish like, like um, swordfish and tuna are polluted with, with mercury, but the little things, sardines, a couple of oysters, a couple Anchovies. of little things. Yeah, might be okay to eat to get some omega-3. But now I'm um, with the people having microplastic in their body, which is still an endocrine disruptor and can, can, can be a risk factor for cancer, and, the, and these toxic compounds in the estuaries and off the, from the um, algae blooms and, the pollu and pollution, it's better, to, I think, to, uh, to avoid fish. Right. It's good for people to, to know as well that the omega-3s that are in fish are originally coming from algae. Mm -hmm. It's fish feeding on the algae and, and moving its way up the food chain. Yeah, but, you know, it still would work, but the question is where do we get the cleanest source? Right. Yeah. I guess I'm just making the point that the algae oil is actually going to the to the direct source. You're <laughs> skipping the fish in the middle, right? So DHA EPA is something that your views have kind of evolved on over the last few decades. Is there anything else? Was there is there any other kind of major blind spots that you've become aware of or um, areas of nutrition that you think plant based eaters need to be more aware of? The only other main factor may be zinc. Maybe some people are going to have better resistance to later life pneumonia and the and curtail immunosenescence, which means the weakening of immune system with aging by having more zinc adequacy. Because you still get zinc in a plant-based diet. It's just that the phy phytates bind zinc, so you don't get as much absorption had you have animal protein. You know, and some people... Um, you know, do better. Um, and do you soak your nuts? What's that? Do you like to soak nuts and seeds? I, I just use some soap and water. Um, that was a stupid joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got that. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but to, to reduce the phytate content, I think some people soak their nuts. But there's phytates. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, there's there's phytates in other foods besides nuts and seeds. I don't think it's important to, to soak your nuts to remove all of the phytates because those phytic acids and other tannic acids have benefit have beneficial effects on the body and bind to other things that aren't unfavorable. That's overlooked. It's you know, so I don't think you, it's going to be a major factor. You don't have to do that, but I think it's probably simpler just to take a little bit of extra zinc. What kind of dose? What low, are we what are we aiming for low in, dose. in terms of zinc? 5, 10, 15, mm-hmm. you know, not high dose. Gotcha. Because we're supplementing what the diet already gives you. You're not getting none in your diet. We're just trying to put people in an optimal sweet spot. Mm. I'm not into high dose supplementation. It's not the more, a little is good, a lot is better. You know what I mean? I'd say 10 would be a probably good, 10 milligrams would be a good dose. Right, so it sounds like you're, if you're talking about zinc, we spoke about B12. I'm getting the feeling that you would be an advocate for some type of multivitamin plus a DHA EPA supplement mm-hmm. for someone that's eating this way. Yes, and and to and of course to be um, transparent, I have my own brand of multivitamins that I designed from people who follow my healthy way of eating, so that I know that they know what I want them to do supplementally to to fill those little gaps. You know, what would you say to someone who just pushes back and says that can't be healthy? Having getting all these nutrients in a supplement that's synthetic. Well, I feel bad for them that they're going to take risks with themselves and people who they advise if they're if they're a leader in this field. Because they're taking risks with people's with people's lives. There's too much evidence. You know, I really um, been very lucky and have had a, um, a a great career being able to help people. Um, and so people who say, "Oh well," people just trying to sell, make money selling supplements, and they're trying to say, "Well, if the nutrients are not in food, they're not good for you." And the food gives you one in a complex matrix that you can't duplicate with a synthetic. And that's just oversimplification and not true. You know. There are some nutrients that we get in phytochemicals, yes, sulfurophane, indole 3 carbonyl nutrients that we get from cruciferous vegetables are fragile, and we, we don't want to take isolated carotenoids. So they can make that argument with some nutrients, but they can't make the argument, oh, because it's not good to take beta carotene extracted from a food. We want to take it in the full complex of 100 carotenoids to get the full benefit. So why should we be extracting zinc or this from, from a food? It, just because it's right with regard to carotenoids doesn't make it right with regard to a mineral that's important for human immunosenescence and neurological senescence too, like zinc and DHA. You know what I mean? So you can't just make a blanket because something philosophically is right in one area doesn't mean it's right across the board. We still have to look at the, look at the overwhelming um, accumulation and the preponderance of evidence and do what's safest for individuals. And multivitamins have a lot of bad things in them that could hurt people too. That's why I originally got into advising people on this, what supplements they should take because traditional multivitamins contain folic acid, which I agree, and beta carotene and vitamin A and, and vitamin E, which in isolated forms don't behave the same way in the synthetic forms and isolated forms don't behave like the full matrix of those nutrients in food. And the, and the t- taking of some of those nutrients like folic acid, which is made from, which is synthetic, it's not the same as folate, can increase risk of breast and prostate cancer. And vitamin A can increase is risk of- Is that clear, that evidence? Because I, I have seen people debate that. <laughs> yes, I think there's a, too much evidence with regard to the dangers of synthetic folic acid. And I don't know how that can be debated unless the person is not aware of all the data that we have collected on that subject. You know, today, if they're just denying all the data, are they suggesting that real folate found in green vegetables and beans isn't as good as taking a synthetic we make from petroleum? And if we're getting, eating a healthy diet with vegetables and beans and our levels of folate are already up above the normal range, do they think taking extra is still good for us when we're already getting a high amount? It's clearly almost, uh, you know, uh, an argument that can't be sustained or you know, if people think to take, take a pill to get folic acid, better than eating the right foods to get folate from. So with regard to this idea of food is our best source of nutrients, I'm agreeing with that. And in most cases, it's true that we shouldn't be taking a synthetic version. But certain minerals and certain things are not, doesn't fit across the board, being correct in every case, of course. So where does the nut- nutritarian diet come in? At what stage of your career did you come up with that? And as a dietary philosophy, we haven't explained it yet, so perhaps you could spend a minute and, and help us understand what the nutritarian diet is all about. Well, when I started writing books, and, and, one of, and my second book was Eat to Live, and in Eat to Live, I discussed the nutrient density of food. 
and I discuss that plant foods, especially green vegetables and other colorful plant foods, have more of the 36 nutrients that the US government keeps track of and measures. That even standard nutrients like vitamins and minerals, these plant foods have very high amounts compared to processed foods or animal products. That animal products are not a rich source of nutrients and they compare to plants Can I ask per a calorie. Quick question on that. Yeah. Because I think right now there's a, there's a huge movement, I'd say, and a theme of people saying that animal foods are in fact the most nutrient dense and in particular organ meats. And I see people posting it all the time on their stories and mm -hmm. talking about these being the prize foods of our ancestors and that they, they are actually the most nutrient dense foods that we can eat and using that to kind of right. advocate for a very animal based diet. So that seems to contradict what you're saying. Yes, it contradicts it because they've picked a selected amount of nutrients, a limited number that animal products are high in compared to plant foods. But if you go through the full um, spectrum of nutrients that humans require. Diversity. A diversity. And particularly the 36 nutrients that humans keep, that the government keeps track of, not the five that are high in animal products. Which are what, like iron yeah, and iron and B12. Niacin and, yeah, and B12. We can pick, there's a, they're high in certain B vitamins for sure. Riable flavin, they're high in um, copper. They're, you know, in other words, we have certain nutrients they're high in. Zinc, iron, much more than animal products are. But we don't look at nutrients that way. So when I'm describing a nutritarian diet, it has to do with the, the, uh, having a variety of nutrients humans need and require for slow aging, which require a high amount of antioxidants and phytochemicals that are plant-derived foods that, plant, that animal products don't give you. And, pro, and there, since there are thousands of phytochemicals, just the phytochemical content alone, the lack of phytochemicals makes animal products void of, of nutrient density. When you're considering nutrients human need, we know phytochemicals and antioxidants are, needing, are needed to pro support later life immune function and slow aging, maintain stem cells, and, and reduce aging of telomeres, and, prevent, and support the immune system protection against cancer. So we know that these, that argument is with the animal products being high in nutrients is not only not true with regard to that argument, but it's also not true when we put people on high animal product diets and follow them to hard endpoints. A hard endpoint means age of death or what they died of, not just a theory that their nutrients are adequate. Seems to me that it's a uh, disagreement or, or discrepancy between what nutrient density means. Yes, The absolutely. definition of nutrient density. Yeah. Has anyone actually put a, a scientific published definition for nutrient density out there? Not really. You know, I had an ANDI scoring system, which stands for the ANDI, A-N-D-I, which stands for Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, which was based on 36 nutrients measured in a 100 calorie portion of each food, showing that green vegetables had the highest nutrient density by far. Nothing was close to them, and, and animal products were way at the bottom, because I was considering 36 nutrients, and I was considering antioxidant capacity too, so, which is so important for human longevity. But so the nutritarian diet is just not about achieving nutritional, a, a high nutrient level, but an adequate amount of a wide diversity of nutrients that humans can benefit from. So it has to do with nutrient diversity and which you have to achieve, you can only achieve by eating a, a lot of different types of plant material to get that wide degree of nutrient diversity. And the other side of that coin, which is important here, is what are the compounds that are deleterious at a certain dose that you're not exposing yourself to. That's correct, of course. Right. And, and also the um, nutrient diversity we're talking about also speaks to plant-based diets that aren't nutrient diverse too, right? Where people are just eating a macrobiotic diet of eating almost all rice. You know, I'm saying that those diets may even be better than a, than a standard American diet because you're not exposing yourself to so much dangerous nutrients, but they don't give you the longevity for potential and protection and immunosenescence and longevity promotion that you could if you had a more diverse diet with, with a lot of different nutrients like obviously greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, G-bombs the way I talk about, right? To get the wide diversity of the nutrients that humans need to maximize um, in the yeah, or, or an ultra processed plant-based diet. That's correct, exactly. Yeah, and there's so plenty of studies looking at an unhealthy plant-based diet index, and you see they don't do so well when you compare them to the healthy plant-based index. That's right. It, it all depends on how you what you compare. And that's why a lot of the studies on meat show don't show a deleterious effect. Because in these people who are advocating meat-based diet can say, look, here's a study when people decrease their meat consumption. They're not living longer lives because they decrease meat consumption. The difference in lifespan is almost is marginal. 
And the reason they can show that is because when they decreased meat, they didn't start eating beans or nuts or vegetables. They decreased meat and ate more chicken, or they decreased meat and ate more cheese. So it's always switching from red meat to white meat, which doesn't show a significant increase in longevity. And they use these people on advocating diets high in meat are using those studies that are people are comparing red meat to white meat, not red meat to beans or red meat to nuts or red meat to greens or red meat to really healthy plants. And in those studies, which we do have a lot of nowadays over the last, it started in 2018. The there was substitution another, analysis. The substitution analysis studies. So now we have a lot of those studies which there have been one published in 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. We have four studies from different researchers around the world showing when they compared animal, pro animal protein to plant protein that substitution diets show dramatic increases in lifespan, demonstrating diets higher in animal protein shorten lifespan and diets higher in plant protein lengthened lifespan. And diets higher in plant protein means those plant protein rich foods which are four foods, beans, nuts and seeds, green vegetables, and whole grains, not fruit, leaving fruit off because fruit- Would you say nuts are high protein? I mean, they contain some protein, but they, they're probably, they're more fat. It's depending on the nut or seed, but yes, they're considerably protein adequate. They range in protein content from like 10% to 30%. You know, meat is, let's say, 30%. Pignolia nuts might be even, um, Mediterranean pine nuts might be 40%. Sunflower seeds might be 14%. So yes, they're protein-adequate foods, um, and in combination with other protein foods you're eating, but the studies on nuts are very dramatically positive. So when people reduce anything in their diet and add more nuts, and switch from an equal and isocalorically change from, let's say, potatoes and add nuts, or reduce meat and add nuts, or reduce... Anything you're eating and you add more nuts to a diet, we see enhancements in longevity, particularly cardiovascular disease mortality goes down, but also all-cause mortality increases. So nuts and seeds are a very powerful food that as a source of fat, it makes the nutritarian diet unique in the degree like, because don't forget, the standard American diet gets its fat from oils or animal fats. But a nutritarian diet rejects both oils and animal fats, but it doesn't advocate a diet be, a diet has to be excessively low in fat as long as you're eating whole foods like nuts and seeds or avocado. That's a little bit different to some of the other vegan diets that are promoted, which are sort of more low total fat. Right, correct. So point being here is that, and this is, I mean, this is my understanding of the science as well, is that these unsaturated fats are inherently healthful and that they don't need to be limited. That's correct. I think the science is overwhelming, and I could say with a degree of scientific integrity to say irrefutable, that thinking you're gonna get better health by taking all the fat out of your diet but not eating nuts and seeds is not, not only not healthy, it's actually hurtful. To your, it increases risk of disease. Tell me about your stance on, on oil then. I'm assuming that it's mostly because it's just super calorie dense and it's not coming with a lot of micronutrients. There are some depending on the oil, but it's very calorie dense and uh, given many people are trying to manage their weight or lose weight, perhaps it's not the, the best thing to do from a satiety point of view. Outside of that, is there a reason to be worried about oils? Like for example, for me, I, I think I have like a fairly high fat plant-based diet compared to some people, but it's low saturated fat. There's quite a lot of nuts and seeds and avocado and tofu, and I will have olive oil, maybe a tablespoon or so a day with cooking. Do you think that's a problem? It would depend on your body fat percent and your bigger, your big strong guy. So it probably could be okay because your caloric needs are relatively higher. Since your caloric needs are higher and your body fat is low, then you're getting your nutrients met with enough food and the concentration, because you're diluting the nutrient density of your diet with oil, because oil is empty calorie food, right? So to the extent that oil becomes a part, a, a, a part of your diet, you've lowered the nutrients in your diet by that extent. But it may be an insignificant extent if you're, working heavy, if you're a person working behind a plow or a physical laborer or going to the gym, or if you're a person lean with a body fat, with a low body fat, and your overall caloric needs are adequately met, your caloric needs are high enough where you can eat enough vegetables, enough beans, enough nuts without putting on extra weight, then the little bit of extra oil would not be that significant. But if you were a person who was a, 
um, a, a middle-aged woman who was working behind a computer who has an extra 30 pounds to lose of weight, then the one tablespoon of oil could inhibit her weight loss and could be ultimately detrimental to her long-term health. So I think that because her over appetite of how much food she needs is much lower. So the oil becomes a higher percent. And also because oil revs up fat storage because it has to be stored as fat. And, it, and for a person that's overweight, it can impede fat loss. So yes, you're saying that um, looking at you, your body fat's probably low. But if I measured your body fat and it was above 15, 15%, I'd say you better, what if you cut out in your diet to reduce your calories? You shouldn't cut out the things that are healthy. You should cut out the oil because it's not necessary nutrient. It's not essential to your health and longevity. Remove that oil from your diet. You'll be better off. But if you're so physically active that your body fat's low and you're in great physical condition, then they have a little bit of oil, no big deal. Okay, no big deal. So because it sounds like to me that that comes back to what's your body composition, total energy intake, and assessing that on an individual basis. But there are also some claims that exist out there that I'm, I'm certain people have come across where someone will say that oils damage your endothelial cells in your arteries and increase risk of cardiovascular disease. They do if you're cooking. If heated oils do do that. You cause oils become rancid. And don't forget, I'm not recommending you do the, you add the oil. It's still a compromise. Um, I don't have any oil in my diet, and I wouldn't add it because I feel like... Don't forget, my underlying primary principle for extending human lifespan is moderate caloric restriction. Moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence or micronutrient adequacy. It's those five words, right? So I, if I want to restrict calories of degree, I'm going to remove the calories that have no that aren't as necessary or powerful to promote longevity. So and even cold pressed oils, they use a lot of them have some glycidal toxin in them. Uh, they have a lot of degree of rancidity from sitting on a shelf for months. They're not nutrient favorable. They're com maybe compared to meat and butter, they are, but still. And compared to a diet with no fat, a little bit of oil may have some positive effect if your diet is so low in fat. But you're much better eating nuts and seeds and excluding the oil. So, and, and if you heat the oil at temperatures, then you're going to cause more acidity and more damage to the endothelium. So I'm not advocating those foods. It's just not so bad if you're somebody like you having a little bit. is probably not that significant. You know. Why do you, I mean, you'd be familiar with PREDIMED, right? PREVIMED, yeah. PREDIMED right. study, right? PREDIMED, yeah. Yeah, PREDIMED. And... It's always intrigued me that they had in the intervention group adopting the Mediterranean diet, there was one with added oil, olive oil, and one with, with nuts, and they seem to do pretty similar. No, that's not true. It's the group that had the longest longevity in, the, in that study were the groups who were eating nuts and seeds before they intervened, who continued on the nuts. See, there were, there were different groups. One group didn't have nuts and seeds, and they added nuts and seeds to the diet. One group had nuts and seeds, and they ate olive oil to the diet. One group they had, so they had like different groups, but the group that had that had the longest lifespan and the redu most reduced rate of cardiovascular death were the groups who were eating nuts and seeds before they intervened, and then their intervention was to add nuts and seeds. So it was nuts and seeds before, and the ones that continue with nuts and seeds had overwhelmingly uh, enhanced benefits. And people take that study and they don't look at the, all the data and all the details. Was that in the first study or is that a secondary analysis? I haven't seen that. Mm. That was in another a secondary analysis? I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Maybe we can dig that up. We can put that into the, mm -hmm. the show notes. I'd love to look right. at that. Um, because that could change my position yeah. on that. And it did show that olive oil was not um, acquired to having no fat or animal fats was, ben was better than nothing, than nothing, right? Yeah. But there was a small advantage you're saying to nuts if they were consuming nuts before and nuts during the intervention. There was a larger advantage, a lot, pretty large advantage for the group that was eating nuts before and continued to eat nuts when they were in, through the intervention group, through the intervention trial. They had a much better, a, a pretty strong ad advantage. Let's look at that data. Yeah, let's look at it. Um, back to your point about these substitution analyses. I think these are really incredible studies. And there's these clear benefits for consumption of legumes and nuts and seeds over fish and over red meat and over white meat. Yes, definitely. Um, fish sometimes is a bit can can change from study to study, but on the whole, you see that trend as you consume more plant protein. There's a benefit. Um, I think some people might push back on on that and hear us talking about that and say, "Yes, but who are those people that are eating more plant protein?" and are they just adopting healthy behaviors across their entire lifestyle? 
Are they exercising more? Are they smoking less? Are they drinking less alcohol? How can we be sure that it is the plant protein that's leading to their better health and not the fact that they're just living a generally healthy lifestyle? I've heard people who are like keto and paleo and carnivore advocates give that argument, but it really does not hold water. You know, these, some of these studies have like 20 nutritional researchers on board. These are some of the top um, scientific nutritional researchers in the world, and they control for all those factors. And it's not that people, so they're comparing like non-smoking and non-cough, you know, they're, they really have gone into incredible detail um, going after con confounding variables. And then we have corroboration from one study to another, including the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2, corroborating those other studies, when Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2 do a very good job with people not smoking and not drinking and if, if people having healthy behaviors, even though they're eating a small amount of animal products compared to none or eating fish compared to none. So we have a, we have a lot of data on that and on the confounding variables. And what about if, if someone pushed back? I enjoy arguing for the other position, <laughs> if you can't tell. Um, what if someone pushed back and said, I hear what you're saying, Dr. Furman, but the, the animal foods that I'm eating are not the same as what people in those studies would be eating. You know, in those studies, they might be eating ultra-processed meats or fast food or burgers. That's also an argument they give, which is not true either. That's totally untrue. Because it's true in this country, there's a lot of the meats are commercially made in, in large factory farms. But as you know from being from Australia, most of the meat they eat there is is grass fed and pasture raised, and most of the, so mo and most of the studies around the world that have where the studies are raising more wild and pasture raised and animals do not show a difference in outcomes. They New Zealand's this, another one. Yes, New, you know, so they don't show a difference. If that was, if they had some data to support that theory, that would be great. But it's not true. The the, the detrimental effects are the same, whether which whichever, um, whichever study you look at, wherever the meat comes from, you know. And it's not the fact that the animal product has antibiotics or lower fatty acids, it's just the fact that driving high levels of animal protein in a human body promotes IG, levels of IGF-1 and cellular replication that are unfavorable for human lifespan and also increase risk of cancer. Excess growth in a fully grown body is not favorable. We know from all species of animals tested that caloric restriction, that, that excess nutrition leads to acceleration of aging. Too much food leads to acceleration of aging. And we're talking here about the effect of excess protein the body doesn't need leading to acceleration of aging. When you get, the, it doesn't matter where the animal product is from, when you have excess protein, especially biologically complete protein you didn't need, the body doesn't just store it as fat, it converts it into hormones that promote growth. And that growth promoting effect, plus the fact that it changes the bacteria in the, in the gut that produce more biological- What's uh, excess protein? Like how would you define that? And, and do you think that that's different in the context of a sedentary person who's not exercising versus someone who's exercising requires more recovery and repair? Yes, but minimally. Let me, that's, a, that's also a good question that involves a thoughtful answer, but let's um, talk about that for a minute. One thing is that we can eat a diet to try to maximize growth in humans for extra athletic performance and size. And I'm suggesting that maximizing performance and size is not the same as maximizing longevity. That Trade-off. As a trade-off, correct. And so, yes, it's true that with more bodybuilding, more musculature, you can keep your body fat lower, and you can utilize the protein to go to muscular use, which will make it safer than a person who's a couch potato eating the excess protein. That's not gonna go to muscular development, it'll go to pushing a tumor development. So even though you, that argument has a point and some validity to it, it's still not good to eat protein to, to maximize muscle growth. Because we know, for example, that, those, that the occupation with the shortest lifespan in North America are linebackers on football teams who eat to, big, to get big so they can do their better at their profession. I don't think they eat a very healthy diet though. And they may take steroids too, I don't even know. But largeness- I think is, they get tested. Yeah, you know so. But largeness is not the criteria for good health. And the human body, generally, we know that um, through all animal studies, that the animals that are un slightly underfed, that are thinner and not allowed to get to their maximum growth, live the longest. Yeah. You know. Can and, I push back a little bit on those experiments? Sure. I totally agree with that. Yeah. My one problem with extrapolating from those studies is those mice are 
their growth is restricted, sexual maturation is delayed. They're in a, a cage, not out in the wild like we are, so they don't really need a robust immune system, a We're sex talking drive. About primate studies too, though, not rodent studies. Right. There's some there's some primate evidence as well, but I think it's a little bit different to a human who's out navigating the wild world to a, a, a rodent or a primate even that's in a cage. Mm, well, not really because I don't think that's a, because we have the same studies on humans too. We know that extra body mass and body fat slows, um, accelerates aging and shortens lifespan. We know that being on the side of the lean side extends human lifespan too. And there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. And we know that even larger muscles can slow, can enhance, can accelerate aging. And we can measure that today. Right. We can measure telomeres. We I'm can talking more about protein defects. restriction. Yes. Not so much. I agree with you on the, on the calorie restriction side right, of things right. totally. Yeah. Um, the protein one, I've gone back and forth. But it's, but I've had Volta Longo on. I've had Stuart Phillips on. I've had Don Lehman on. I've had Chris Gardner on. And everyone has a slightly different view and the reason i asked you that question about resistance training was i saw this study i'll send it to you it's it's a year old it was a really interesting study they were looking at protein or they were looking at igf1 levels right. in three different contexts one is if you just go and exercise what happens to igf1 levels and they measured it acutely and then they measure a 24 hours after as well second context is just protein have 40 grams i believe of protein they're measuring igf1 after and then looking at 24 hours later third context is exercise plus protein so in these three there's there's some in really interesting things to talk about here one is exercise itself raises igf1 more than protein and i think most of us would agree that exercise is a healthy thing right so if we simply look at an acute change in igf1 we we may otherwise be led to believe that exercise is bad and could raise cancer risk, but it seems to do the opposite long-term chronically. The second finding that I thought was really interesting was I'm when not, you- I'm not agreeing with that, by the way. You are? I'm not agreeing You're with not that. agreeing. Okay, we'll yeah, come okay. back to it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the second point that I found was really interesting was if you consume protein, but you're not exercising, IGF-1 goes up and it stays up. If you're exercising, IGF one went up, but then it actually returns. It was the lowest out of all of the groups. Yeah, because that's what I was. That's the part I was going to say. What I'm. That's the part I was going to add to what I said. I didn't agree. It was because when you exercise, the the muscles are utilizing the growth and the protein in the IGF one. So you need localized IGF one for muscle growth. But over time, the current the chronicity of exercise helps you maintain lower levels of IGF-1 throughout life because you're constantly, you, muscles are dri you're driving the IGF-1 not to focus on organ and, and growth stimulation, but to maintain muscle mass. That's, this is the, the critical point that no one I've, I've had on yet, We've, we haven't got to this point, is how important is the tissue specificity? Where is IGF-1? Where is it um, activating mTOR? Is it in muscle cells versus in other cells in the body? And I kind of have this theory that if you're driving IGF-1 up, but it's in muscle cells, that's a different context to someone driving up IGF-1 who's metabolically not healthy and is sedentary. That's true. I agree with that, by the way. Now, I, I agree with what, what you're saying, but keep in mind with, um, that people who are generally um, focused on bodybuilding and performance, they want to get, go for excessive muscle growth for performance and for looks. And... And, uh, and to get to eat enough calories and to have IGF-1 levels to maximize their size is not favorable for longevity. You know, so like take me, for example. I was an athlete most of my life. Um, and I could bench press a lot of weight for my hand. Do, you know, I was very physically fit. I could jump up on tables and very, um, for my size, but I didn't try to maximize size. In order to get bigger than 150 pounds or 155 pounds, I'd have to eat more protein, more animal products. If I want to get to 165 or 170 at 510, I can't do it on my diet. I have to go off my diet to eat more food that way. And I could, and I probably wouldn't be as bad off as a person who got to 165, um, who was a, who did it through being sedentary in the same diet. The extra exercise made it safer, but not as safe and not as longevity promoting as eating right and keeping my weight at 150 pounds. I still have good musculature, a six pack, 
and the ability to do 70 push-ups and 10 shins and to be able to bench press more than my body weight. But I don't want to push myself to a degree of performance that would be um, not achievable with a healthy diet and because I don't want to sacrifice my chance for maximizing human longevity. So I That's think- a good point about strength though that I think is lost is that because there is this movement towards hypertrophy, building muscle. But when you look at longevity strength correlates better with longevity than muscle mass right even though there's some association between strength and muscle mass you can build strength without building a lot of muscle right um yeah i want to be as fit and strong as i can for my best biological weight i have a certain set point and my weight just seems to want to set here i have to really overeat to get it above that set point if I underread, I really it's still hard for me to drop from the set point. If I overread, it's hard for me to gain from the set point. I'm trying to eat to maintain my set point with as little food as possible. So I, I want to maintain this degree of musculature and this degree of strength that I can measure in the gym, but I want to do it with the least amount of food as possible, not the most amount of food as possible. And with the least amount of protein, not the most amount of protein. But I'm saying there's a big difference between the biological effects of animal protein because of plant protein, because the plant protein is not so biologically complete, and the body can make the complete to meet the IGF-1 needs of my exercise needs, but it's too easy to overshoot those needs when you're eating animal protein because it's all biological complete to begin with. So your body doesn't have to make it complete. It doesn't have to manufacture it. It's already there, and it's very easy to overshoot your needs when you're eating animal protein. So the question really is how much animal protein should a person eat and not overshoot it? And the answer, you know, so I'm, so I'm saying here that when you say the body doesn't have to make it because it's already complete, yes, it would it would be broken down into the amino acids first, though, and then absorbed, right? Yes, but the body um, the body can digest lo- the bacteria in the gut to increase amino acids. It can it could digest the lining of the gut itself. The endothelial lining gets digested, so we eat some meat from our own body when we yeah, absorb food, and we get amino acids from a mixture of food that's all also in the interstitial tissue around the digestive tract. So the body has the ability to see a more complete protein that enters the bloodstream for utilization for muscle growth, even when we're not eating complete proteins. The body can still have a complete protein in the blood when we're not eating complete proteins. The body can, can break down even more. If it's missing something or needs more, it can get more of those amino acids for muscle growth if it needs to. Um, by, but if you're eating animal products, it's so easy for the body to overshoot the amount it needs, and now the body's not manufacturing or having enough amino acids in the blood to be biologically useful. It has too much in the blood to be biologically useful. You've overexceeded what you really need. So what does the body do with the excess? And I'm saying that excess has been, there's too much evidence to suggest that excess is unfavorable. And the studies we have showing diets that switch from animal protein to plant protein, which lower protein bioavailability, IGF-1 is lower, and other, fa- other um, pro-inflammatory substances go down as well, like TMAO and other um, factors that could create more inflammation, plus the exposure from the other substances in plant foods that are beneficial leads, seems to indicate for lifespan extension. And I'm not really advocating that I don't have to have, um, like, I'm f- like giving people information so they can utilize it if they want to. You know what I mean? I'm not like forcing people to follow my advice. If they want to get bigger and eat more animal products, they can do it. But I would like them to, but they're most likely um, reducing their longevity potential and eating increasing risk of disease in the process. Yeah, that point about other nutritional factors is interesting. How do we... How do we get a feel for whether it is the swapping of animal protein for plant protein that's leading to these benefits that show up in substitution analyses, or if it could be the extra exposure to polyphenols and other phytochemicals, for example? Well, because we have, you know, we're looking for scientific reasons to explain the findings. And why do these studies corroborate each other and show these consistent findings when we do the swapping studies? And so the scientists involved um, usually list certain reasons why they think we're getting the results they're getting, because that's what science is. You have an outcome, and then you try to put up measurements and markers as to why you think the outcomes work this way. What are the mechanisms? What are the mechanisms involved? And people like to hear the mechanisms involved and the whys, because as you're seeing it, because people will use the whys and argue the hypotheses, but they won't argue the outcome. They, you need and, both. You need both, right. And right. even the short-term studies, 
um, give you a hypothesis, but until you have long-term studies looking at hard endpoints and seeing how long people are really living, you don't have a lot of um, definitive evidence. I think that's a good principle for people to think about is converging lines of evidence. Yeah, What do you see in benchtop science, in animal studies, and in observational research, clinical trials looking at short-term changes in biomarkers? What direction are we pointing in yeah, exactly generally um and it helps you build a bit more of a, a stronger case and gives you more confidence in whatever conclusion you're coming to hey friends are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level look no further than my digital guide plant-based ferments inside you'll discover some of my favorite recipes including my soy labne and homemade kombucha visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details that's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. You mentioned before uh, that these low carbohydrate animal based diets are not as good when it comes to longevity. And you're a doctor. And so you are seeing patients and um, no doubt have a lot of compassion and love for your patients. (laughs) Some of the anecdotal stories of people adopting these animal-based low-carbohydrate diets um i mean it leaves me empathizing with with them because they report having some type of autoimmune condition or inflammatory condition with debilitating symptoms and then feeling significantly better how do how do we kind of reconcile that and if you had someone in front of you that was going through that and was explaining to you the benefits that they have experienced from eliminating plant foods, all of the foods that that you're advocating for, um, but is open-minded and, and is also considering their long-term health. How would you have that conversation? I think, well, it, it leads to two different thoughts here. One is that some people don't thrive on a plant-based diet, and the question is why. And whatever their genetics or individual needs are, we try to ascertain what those needs are and meet them. And even if it's necessary for some people to eat some animal products, then I would do so to benefit their, their long-term outcome or their outcome for them and not hold to a philosophical viewpoint of what's better for me or somebody else. I'd still want to do what's best for them if they have that need, number one. Um, but we try to um, utilize as little of the animal product as possible as they need to get enough of certain thing that they may require, which is usually slow the digestive process down and get more zinc and you know whatever the, re- the things they're getting more iron, whatever thing they, they need. Um, some people are like like um, you know hypomethylators or something or whatever. So we they might not thrive on a totally plant based diet. And I'd still say there's so many beneficial factors in the plant foods that are important for human immune system and longevity. We'd still try to incorporate as much plant food as possible and as little animal product as possible to have them thrive. Now you have a person that's the other direction where they seem to thrive better almost all animal products when they take all the plants out. And then the question is, well, what was there in the plant foods that were causing an excitation of their immune system? Because it probably wasn't everything, they were, every plant food they were eating. It was probably certain things they were sensitive to. So then the question would be to how to determine what foods they can eat from the plant kingdom that would be safe for them and still maintain the benefits. And then to see if we can improve their digestive health and their gut health so they can tolerate more and more of these foods. And even allergies, we have even let people recover from allergies over time. And we sometimes use oral tolerance therapy once they're eating healthy for a long enough period of time. But we can't even use oral tolerance to improve their allergies until they're able to sustain a, a, a high exposure, like you're saying, to polyphenols and antioxidants for a long enough period of time to improve immune function that now we can use to have them be, become less allergic or, or sensitive to certain foods. So one, we're going to look at what nutritional deficiencies and what individual variabilities they have that make them different from, from a person that doesn't have some of this genetic feature, and, and also what are the particular animal products that might be tr- um, sensitized and uh, handling or digesting well, and try to design a diet that's best for them without excluding throwing away every good thing that they could be eating that could help their longevity just because they do better when they cut out beans or nuts or some other food like that. So it's complicated, you know. But it's most often, it's, that's not most often the case. Those are very rare instances. It's most often the case that people can make a recovery from their autoimmune condition, conditions eating healthy plant-based diets, and they do better off without animal products, which create more inflammatory substances in their body. It's more often the other case, but still individuals are different enough 
that you have to be flexible enough to do what works for a person. What kind of results have you seen with patients that have certain autoimmune conditions who have been able to, to successfully adopt a nutritarian diet? Yeah, I see predictable um, responses. Psoriasis goes away, lupus, asthma, connective tissue disorders, rheumatoid arthritis. My experience is that it's very rare that I can't have a person recover completely from their autoimmune disease. So much so that I've had multiple individuals who had lupus. One particular teenager had a creatinine of 4.2, which represents significant loss of kidney function. And she was on the national renal transplant list waiting for a new kidney. And by changing her diet, she was able to um, get well again and have her kidney function return to normal, which even shocked me. So I've seen some very, very advanced cases and severe cases of people who've made complete recoveries through excellent nutrition, you know, but it doesn't mean I won't continue to modify things to try to get people if I need to be, need to. I don't have a standard one size fits all advice. Right. When I think about this and the anecdotes that you can hear on, on both sides, I think about what's the overlap here? And one thing that just pops up is both diets tend to be devoid of ultra processed foods and can help people lose weight, at least in the short term. Absolutely. And it's a lot of times, um, as you know, fasting has a huge history on resolving autoimmune inflammatory conditions. And I don't even fast people right away with asthma, let's say, for example, because they're on steroids or a person with, uh, you know, on Imuran or immunosuppressive drug. It's not even safe to fast them. They may require six months of eating healthfully to slowly wean down off their medications. And then I might put them on a caloric re a fast or a caloric restricted period. So their body, like, it, it restricts the hyperactivity of the immune system to allow the body to calm down enough to get back to normal function again. Is that a shortening of like a daily eating window or is that a more like a weekend fasting? How do you like to do that protocol? It's really very, you know, and don't forget, I'm not recommending or utilizing sure. fasting for weight loss. This is for people with autoimmune conditions or an asthmatic coming off their steroids or a lupus patient could facilitate a, re a remission. In these cases, I'm traditionally fasting them approximately 10 days of just water. I'm taking, but I'm not doing it till their health improves enough so they can sustain that. It's by that prolonged period of not eating for seven to 10 days, then going back to having moderate caloric restriction again, it could curtail the hyperactivity of the immune system so they're not attacking their own body. And we, what we're trying to do is facilitate a remission. Is that something you do, you facilitate in person down at your retreat? Or is that done uh, like remotely with patients? No, I don't usually do it remotely with patients. But I do have people who have, who have a history of Crohn's or, or ulcerative colitis who fast two or three days a month or two or three days every six weeks as a means of maintaining remission from their um, inflammatory bowel disease. So some of these people have gotten off medications they're no longer putting blood in their stool. They're, they're, they've improved their digestive capacity to the point, but they're still somewhat um, more susceptible to developing a flare down the road. So by may, even they're off medication, they're doing well. We sometimes have them fast regularly to have to improve their digestive capacity. What about cardiometabolic conditions? So people that are coming to you with maybe a history of heart disease, Maybe they have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Maybe they have type two diabetes. Yeah, that's the bread and butter. Right. What are you What are you noticing in these patients when they're adopting your way of eating? Well, it varies from person to person, but generally they're off their insulin, and their type two diabetes resolves within the first few weeks or the first month. Sometimes it could take longer when a person's particularly overweight and they've taken you know drugs, oral hypoglo you know agents for a long time. But usually it's pretty quick. How much and weight would that someone typically lose in that first month? Well, the average male loses about twenty five pounds, and the average fe overweight male, and the average female loses about fifteen pounds the first month. Um, but I've had it depends on how heavy they are and how you know how close they are to their ideal weight. But they usually slow down after that because they lose a lot of water weight and fluid the first month. After that, they slow down to about 10 or 12 pounds a month. But I've had a lot of people lose, continue to lose 15 pounds a month. Right. Once, but, you, once you lose 10 or 15% of body weight, a lot of people can go into remission on type, if they have type 2 diabetes, right? If they haven't had it for too long. It depends on the, the direction of travel of their weight. In other words, they're gonna, as long as they're eating calorically less food and their body is moving in the right direction, they could, their diabetes could go away. But they're still overweight. They're just losing 2 pounds or 3 pounds a week. But if they 
start to level their weight off at a weight that's still above their ideal weight, their diabetes can start to worsen and come back again. What I'm saying right now, I consider a nutritarian a person who's striving, eating and at their ideal weight, which is a body fat below 25% for a female, below 15% for a male, or a person who's losing weight, eating right, and moving in the direction of, the, of, of achieving their ideal weight. If they lost weight and they stabilize at a high weight, they're no longer doing the right thing and they could start to have certain symptoms come back. And if they start to gain again, even if they're at a lower weight than initial weight, the gaining process could make their, could start inflammation occurring and then insulin resistance occurring and start to get more um, inflammatory markers coming off the fat supply. And the estrogen, promoting estrogen production and insulin production. Let me say, I'll give an example here, okay? A person comes into my facility and they lose 50 pounds in those first three months and they leave. They lost 50 pounds. And the risk of having, and their diabetes is gone, and their estrogen levels are lower, their insulin production is lower, their inflammatory markers are lower, and the risk of having a heart disease or having a heart attack is a thousand times less. And they go on a cruise ship or they go to Vegas and pig out on the big buffet and gain 10 pounds back. In the week they've gained 10 pounds back, they're still 40 pounds down from where they were initially because they lost 50 pounds. But now that they're at a higher risk than they would have when they started at a 50 pounds heavier because of the recent gain of 10 pounds, because of the direction of travel of their weight going up so fast. So your health and your inflammatory markers has to do with um, the direction of, of what your diet is and the, the weight your weight is traveling and what direction it's traveling in. Because if you start to regain weight, even if your weight is at a lower point, you still could exacerbate and worsen your condition. Let's double click on that though, because weight regain is very common. And I've got a quote here from a Kevin Hall review on weight loss a couple of years ago. He says, in a meta-analysis of 29 long-term weight loss studies, more than half of the lost weight was regained within two years. And by five years, more than 80% of lost weight was regained. And I'm saying that's, that I would thought it would have been more than 80% because there's only like two or three people out of 100 on, on regular diets keep weight off long-term, you know? So losing weight keeping it off in the long term is difficult, right? How do, you, how do you help your patients not become one of these statistics? That's right. And that's what my career has been focused on, you know, really teaching people the tools, the information they need to learn to make sure they don't have that happen to them, including what I just told you that, and why I even set up my retreat where people come who are with food addiction and obesity to reverse heart disease and diabetes, and, and they're reversing their inclination to want to eat more calories than they need too. And that's why I want them there for two or three months to do that. It's like a cocaine addictive center with, with this is for food. You, you can't come off cocaine. If you stop cocaine for two weeks, your chance of recidivism is much higher than if you're off the cocaine for three months. So we're talking here about not just learning the right way to eat and having your taste muscle get stronger and learning how to make the recipes, but we're also turning, working on a person emotionally and psychologically and intellectually to have them think differently about who they are, what their passions are in life, what they want to achieve, what, where they, how they go after to build their self-esteem, all looking at all the factors that, that create the inability to stay with a diet. And, don't, and we're asking people to live differently than their peers. In an environment which is largely set up to conspire against weight loss. <laughs> exactly. So it requires some individual strength of character and knowledge to be able to continue to live this way. And I'm suggesting that um, when you have self-generated self-esteem, as opposed to externally generated self-esteem, people have much less chance of recidivism. So I have this person who, they went through eating this way. They felt lousy eating this way at the beginning because they're detoxifying and they're feeling, they're, with, they're withdrawing from their old diet. And that doesn't make them feel better. They went through a period of time where they're actually feeling better now because they spent enough time doing this that their taste buds have improved, they're getting their strength and energy back, they lost their brain fog, they start to cultivate a like for eating this way, which they couldn't stand at the beginning, eating this way, because they wanted all the salt and sugar that they're missing. But now they got to a point where they're more comfortable eating this way. And then they go home, and it's too hard for them to do it from the peer pressure and the negativity they're getting from the, pe from the people around them. And so we're trying to train them, so we're talking about self-generated self-esteem. They don't need the approval of other people. They're not looking for other people's consent or um, you could say promotion of, you know, of, of, of approval points. You know how people, they post on Instagram, they want to have the best 
They want to look the best. They want to have the best um, education. They want to drive the fanciest car. They want to look impressive in the way they dress. They're trying to get other people to be impressed with them. And they think that's the way they build their self-esteem. When in fact, educational achievement, having a good job, making a lot of money, doing all these things, being a successful, famous person doesn't really correlate with happiness, with your happiness quotient and your ability to sustain a, a happy and pleasurable life. How do you get people to understand that when they're at the retreat? Uh, we do. We, wa we work on this. We work on that when a person attacks you with some statement like, oh, if I had to eat that way, I'd rather be dead even. Who wants to live on, living on carrot sticks the rest of your life? You know. So now the question is, is your response to protect your ego, to argue, and to so you're not looked on negatively? Or is your response to show this person love and creative goodwill? Is there some creativity, intelligence in your response that is there to help this other person? And have them, and it doesn't have to help them. It just has to have a purpose that you're demonstrating an attempt to try to help them. It's not about you anymore. It's how you can use your mind creatively to think of how you can be useful to this person. Even the chance of really helping them is one in a hundred. But you're building your self esteem based on your attempt and desire to be useful to humanity or appreciate what's around you and your ability to develop care and feelings for others, not to build your own. Um, ego and, all, and your own feeling like you're above or superior to them. So you're no longer affected by these negative insults or negative statements because you've kind of removed yourself and you say, well, why am I replying? How, what's the purpose of my reply? What am I really hoping for here? And with you trying to have a good effect on another person, it actually helps you. It starts to make you more connected to other people and more care about them and more feeling for them. And ultimately, your happiness has to be your ability to have emotions and care for other people as much as you in a strong manner. Um, so we're cultivating those kind of superpowers in people because if we look at the people that do succeed with long-term weight loss, it's people who achieved, they've become a role model and they feel that them be, their own becoming of a role, mo role model gives them more power to influence people positively and affect their people they come in contact with in a more favorable fashion. And they're proud of themselves for doing that. Which is probably yeah. true. Like people tend yeah. to follow what you do more than what you say. Yeah, right. From an inspiration point of view. Right. So we're trying to inspire people to be happier in general, to appreciate the world around them. And we notice that when a person becomes more food addicted or addicted to drugs or smoking or whatever, the addictive substances and the brain's relationship with those addictive substances drive their behavior and makes them less ability to relate to the outside world and less caring and less passionate and less because they're driven by their desire to meet their need for addictive substances, which overtakes their desire to be useful to the, um, to the external world. How important is the kind of reason behind the behavior change? So often you see someone who has a big health scare yeah. Right, they they may be much more um, disciplined with the changes that they make because they have this huge motivation of this. Their life sort of flashed before their eyes, or maybe they saw a partner have a huge health scare. And do you think that that person has greater chance of succeeding than someone who hasn't experienced that? Well, yes, because they're now looking for something and they're willing to put the work in. But not necessarily if a person who hasn't had the health scare is willing to put the work in and study and to learn more about this. You know, like give me an example is that we run these events, for example, for a week, and the wife is coming to learn at the event, but the husband's just coming to play golf. He doesn't wanna even eat the food there. But just for his wife, he sits in the lectures. And he sits there over the week hearing the lectures and playing golf in the afternoon, and at the end of the week, he changes his diet, which he had no intention of doing because he never thought he would learn all this information. It has to do with, and we've tested this out, it's just how much knowledge the person has and how deep their knowledge has been, has been investigated, tested, and trained. And we can do a test on. So yes, if a person who's not motivated by a tragic or a medical condition um, gets exposed to a lot of right information, it's still possible for them to be motivated for, to prevent something before it even occurred. You know, that's one of my motivations too. I'm always telling people, you know, it's your lifetime exposure to sodium that affects your card your um, stroke risk in later life. It's your lifetime exposure to DHA, not what you took in the last five years of your life that determines your brain size, you know, and when you're, when you're 90. 
And likewise, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association telling people who have heart disease to cut back on salt is ridiculous. It's like telling a person who's, who has lung cancer to, cut, to stop smoking when, once they have lung cancer. If stopping smoking was advisable, we should advise it for the whole population, not for the person who develops the disease. If cutting back on salt is advisable, it should be advisable to the whole population, including children, not with regard to people who develop heart disease only. And we know that populations that don't salt their food the, you don't see the rise of blood pressure in children. We see a rise of blood pressure in children. By the time they're 19, they have, they have higher blood pressure than populations that don't take salt in their diet as children. And, and heart disease develops and the weakening of the endothelial lining occurs all through life from eating the poor diet. We don't just wait till we develop a problem and try to improve it. And so the point I'm making here is that this should be throughout the whole population these things should be taught, and it should be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional science taught in grade schools, and it should be per permeate all parts of our population. And then people could start to learn, be more educated, and informed. Now we're seeing people getting all kinds of mixed messages. They're all confused. They can do. They can justify any way they want to eat with any kind of um, group that it, that is kind of like promoting that, and it's difficult for individuals. Right. There's a lot, certainly a lot of anecdotes out there mudding the waters. Um, but that, that point that you just made there about smoking is something I've seen some researchers recently writing about cholesterol and talking about cholesterol years, like yeah. pack years. Pack, yeah, I call it salt years, the same yeah. thing. It's, it's the years of being doing things mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah, that's a really important point. So we spoke about weight loss, but something I wanted to, to sort of double click on there with you is there has been this idea that's become more prevalent or certainly has, has got more exposure, metabolically healthy obesity. So I wanted to get your view on whether being overweight is always unhealthy. Does it have to do with the fat distribution, whether it's subcutaneous or visceral? Um, how would you sort of recommend someone navigates this? I don't think there's such thing as a healthy overweight person. I think that's politically and social nonsense. Um, that because people have trouble losing weight because the, we have such a dangerous food environment, and because people get acclimated to being to be the social climate um, climate of eating like other people, that everybody becomes overweight and it becomes impossible not to become overweight if you if you eat the same way other people eat in America. And it's not, um, and ninety percent of the population is overweight. When I use BMI of 23 as the demarcation line between normal weight and overweight, the the, Nash, the um, health authorities tell us 70% of people are overweight, and I'm saying that's because they use 25 as the BMI as a demarcation line. That's over. That's you know all along in society is BMI is below 23, and maximum longevity occurs usually with men with BMIs below 22 and women with BMIs below 21. So we're talking here about most of the population is overweight, and to the degree that you're overweight, as you go up from that. Um, weight that would be more lifespan favorable, you see higher rates of insulin production. Before the glucose starts to become metabolically determined to be high, even if you have a normal glucose, being fat on the body makes you insulin resistance, and you have to produce more insulin to keep the glucose in the normal range now. So that pancreas is working overtime. Right, so you're working overtime, and higher levels of insulin are metabolically and lifespan unfavorably. They promote fat storage, they accelerate um, cellular growth, and fat on the body still promotes pro-inflammatory compounds. Fat on the body is not um, natural tissue. It's kind of pathological tissue that has poor oxygenation. So and when you're assessing someone, do you place much emphasis on the distribution of that fat? Are you just no. looking at BMI or do you look at waist circumference and no. triglycerides? Like you, you, you're trying to get an idea as to I don't care. how much visceral fat? No. No. I measure visceral fat on the machine, but I've never seen a case that had um, never seen any one person who's had favorable visceral fat where they've been obese. I've never seen what you're saying. Is a person going to have um, a lot of subcutaneous fat but have favorable visceral fat? Never seen it occur. It's if like someone, it's a hypothetical thing. Yeah, you know, if someone's uh, wondering, yeah. Yeah. what's what's the difference between visceral and, and subcutaneous, subcutaneous fat? Why is visceral fat such a problem for metabolic health? Well, it's, it's more saturated. It produces higher cholesterol. It's surrounding your internal organs and interfere with their function, and it's more diabetic and metabolically unfavorable. So certainly we recognize visceral fat 
And like the, the internal fat, the subcutaneous fat is the fat you can pinch on your waist. But when you start to eat in a way that you're getting caloric exposure, faster than the body can store subcutaneous fat, you'll even produce fat that's more visceral because your body can't even store faster fat any faster than the food you're eating. And as the fat gets more viscerally stored, you'll put more cholesterol deposits around your heart. And it's the newly laid down plaque, the most recently laid down plaque that becomes more vulnerable to having a heart attack and causing, a, and causing damage because the older plaque can become more calcified and more invaded with scar tissue and smooth muscle and less chance of rupturing and causing a thrombus. So what I'm saying is, yes, visceral fat is more dangerous. It raises cholesterol, it raises inflammation, and it's more organ-generated fat. And it can happen when you can store visceral fat if you're eating to gain weight more rapidly. Where you're yo-yo dieting, where you lose weight, and you then, instead of putting your, you put weight back on more quickly, you can put back more visceral. But all overweight people have too much visceral fat. We should have almost no visceral fat. It should be almost undetectable. And, you know, myself and my family and people who follow my nutritional program, we put them on the machine. Their visceral fats are almost are, are very extremely low. And all overweight people have, still have too much visceral fat. So even though it's more dangerous, we can't get an overweight person to get a favorable level of visceral fat because they have right. too much fat on their body. And there are some genetic differences, right, where Asian populations tend to, to have more visceral fat at a given BMI. Yeah, I, I think that's also true. And I th also think maybe it's sometimes the eating this diet of so much white rice with such a high glycemic carbohydrate, even though when they start to gain weight, their beta cells in their pancreas have been so kind of overworked for most of their life, still functional, but if you push that over the top, you add the oils and the grease and the animal products and more refined carbohydrates, more soda, more honey, you know, then they're gonna get, floor, get diabetes at a lower body weight than a person who's had a, maybe a, who's gained weight in a different way. But just to underline something that you said before, let's say someone's listening right now who's been diagnosed with prediabetes or type two diabetes, and they're listening and they're thinking, I'm going to give this a go. I'm going to adopt this way of eating that Dr. Furman's talking about and lose some weight. What you're saying is there's a chance if they lose enough weight that, and if they have enough um, beta cell function remaining, that they could significantly reduce their medications or come off them. More than 90%, easily 90%, maybe more than that, can come off them with type 2 diabetes, can get off the medication, become non diabetic. And it's not only having beta cell reserve left, it's also reclaiming some non functioning beta cells that are hibernating due to inflammation. And lack of, so we see that um, we have not only do we see the body's insulin needs be less, but we also see a recovery of the, of the pancreas to produce some more insulin. So yes, I see type two diabetes routinely get better, but of course there are gonna be some type one and a half and people whose pancreas are so burned out that they still would require some medication or some insulin. Um, but that's not common, that's, you know, that's very uncommon. How does someone determine what their ideal body weight is? I think you know, we usually measure, measure their body fat percent as a good, getting a good indicator and seeing, well, you know, if they put their body fat in a favorable range, like, um, you know, what's, the, you know, it's not that hard. And also when they eat healthfully and lose weight, if they keep eating healthfully, their body keeps losing to, a, and it stops losing when it reaches their ideal weight, usually at a more closer to their set point, at a weight that's usually thinner than they, than they might think they would have been able to reach to, you know. So generally I'm saying people should be thinner than they, what they think is right. When people come in to see me, they think, oh, I'm 50 pounds overweight. And I'm thinking, you're not, you're 60 pounds overweight. I'm 80 pounds overweight, you're not, you're really 100 pounds overweight. Because what they're thinking they need to lose, they need to lose more. Because I have these ultimate expectations. I'm going for, my as well shoot for perfection and get the body fat below 25% if they're a female and below 15% of a male, which is not perfection. I'm almost 70 years old and my body fat percent is 11%. So 15% so is still a compromise. Why should they have more than 50% body fat? How do we reduce our appetite? Because what can often happen and what you see in the literature here is someone loses a lot of weight their uh, total daily energy expenditure goes down and they may have the same appetite or even more drive. It's like biology is kind of conspiring against the weight loss in this circumstance from a survival point of view. So this is where satiety seems to be really important. What are the things that someone can think about or draw on when they're making their meals or at the grocery store in terms of 
how do you how do you get more satiety, increase satiety per calorie? Right. Well, that's kind of like what my job is and what my specialty is. Now you're in my wheelhouse. You know what I mean? This is what we do. We have people. How can just the answer to that question is how do I be satisfied with the right amount of calories, and how do I eat instinctually? So the amount of calories and food I desire is the right amount. Why should you? Why should there be a, a, you know, a disconnect between the amount what you feel like eating and what's best for your body? It should be the same. So we want people to instinctually prefer the right amount of calories, but don't forget that doesn't happen overnight. That takes time and training. You didn't become a, fan, a great athlete overnight either. You had to train with the right methods and technique for many years. So with training and with time, so we give people the right training. But they have to continue with repeating and practicing that over and over again. And eventually it happens where you're satisfied with the right amount of food. And then we're giving people both an adequate food volume and, a length, and lengthening the process of digestion with slowly digestible foods. So they're not feeling wasted and empty in the middle of the afternoon, let's say. What kind of foods are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about um, mixing four types of foods. And those four, let's, in, let's my, my typical lunch, I might have a salad and a bowl of vegetable bean soup and a piece of fruit for dessert, which is a light meal, but I made sure the salad had some nuts and seeds in it and the soup had some beans in it. So I had the beans and the nuts and the vegetables in the same meal and some fruit for dessert. Or at dinner time, I may have some quinoa, I may have green vegetables, I may have a little bit of bean or a little bit of... Um, but I also had some little bit of nuts and seeds and a little bit of bean and a little bit of grain and a little bit of, so I, and I had some raw food for dinner too. And I also had dessert. I also had my frozen cherries, my whipped, my baked apple with the vanilla ice cream on top. I had my um, coconut macaroon or something. I had some dessert and dessert's an important part of this to, to, constri to constrict appetite because I'm going to eat the dessert before I'm full and I could still want more food, but I felt I had enough of a plate of food and now by having the dessert before I'm full, it marks the end of eating for the day. I have something that's really satisfying and tastes you know, really delicious, and now I can shut down the restaurant, which means the kitchen, clean the kitchen, put the food away, clean my teeth, and be occupied with other non-food activities that are fun the rest of the night, and stay away from food. Last night was a perfect example for me, because I'm trying to do what I advise my patients and clients to do. Do you find it hard at times? At times it did. Like last night, I went to a, we went dancing, my wife and I out after we ate dinner. Now, I didn't want to eat much dinner because I knew I was going to go to this dance class, right? Actually, we did the Argentino tango last night, okay? So we came home and I said, you know, I really didn't eat that much at dinner because I ran out to go to this dance class and I really feel like eating, but I know it's best for my, and I'm a little hungry. But I just had a glass of water. I watched the end of the basketball game and I went to bed. I started to watch a movie, but I fell asleep and went to bed. I woke up in the morning this morning took up before I came here, and I was hungry. So I picked a, a, a pretty hefty breakfast. But the point was, I could have eaten at nighttime before I went to bed and think, I'm hungry, I might as well eat. But I knew the hunger is so light, with such a light, that when you really have a, when you're in touch with true hunger, it doesn't make you uncomfortable. It doesn't make you interfere with sleep. And you know it's best to sleep on an empty stomach and not to have food in your belly when you're trying to sleep at night, because that's lifespan enhancing. So I purposely didn't eat. At last night, even though I might have come back from dinner, from dancing, a little hungry. So you try so, and have a couple of hours before bed where you're not having food, ideally? I try to have four hours before bed with no food. I try to go to bed, at, finish eating by six o'clock, and go to bed around 10 o'clock. So I want to have, I don't want to feel like my stomach is still digesting when I'm lying in bed trying to sleep at night, because when you're sleeping at night, that's where you have enhanced healing, detoxification, removing of free radicals, repairing of the, and more weight loss occurs, by the way. But of course, we're talking that the anti-aging and longevity promoting phenomenon of the body is enhanced during sleep and is enhanced further when you're sleeping without digesting. So you usually have about 12 hours each day where you're not having food from correct. that dinner until the till your first food in the morning. That's correct. More than 12 hours. Let's see, if I stopped eating at six and I certainly don't eat before seven or eight in the morning. So maybe so, 14 so hours. So maybe 14 hours, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's probably. You mentioned soup and salads. This is something I've found, and I have seen this in the research as well, but I, I wanted to ask you this. Do you think the, the order of your food affects your total energy intake? So I had a salad yesterday before I had my dinner, and it was this giant salad, with so many dark leafy greens. There was nuts in there, and there was a little bit of avocado, and there was no sort of calorie-dense dressing on it. 
And by the time I finished that thing, I was full. And I looked at my main meal and honestly, I had to force myself a little bit to eat that main meal. I didn't finish it. I put it in the fridge. So is there something in the, if we're striving for weight loss, considering the order of, of the food that we're eating? Yes, definitely. Well, that's a great tool for weight loss because you had the raw vegetables first. And raw vegetables are not all um, like raw jicama, raw carrots, raw beets, raw peppers, raw anything you eat. The raw um, food is not as bioavailable calorically. You lose some caloric absorption. And the raw vegetables, obviously, as you know from the salad, take up volume in the stomach and you have stretch receptors and you can feel, and you feel more satiated from the chew, all the chewing too. The time you spend chewing and also breaking down and chewing really well also satisfies your desire for to chew and your desire for, for nutrients as well. So yes, definitely that um, incorporating a mixture of raw and cooked vegetables and starting each meal with raw vegetables, having salad before lunch and having raw vegetables with a dip before dinner or another, you know, definitely helps people control their desire to overeat. And we want people to be satisfied, but not distended or full. Do you think dressings sometimes throws people off a little bit when it comes to salads? I mean, there's all sorts of super calorie dense dressings that you can find. But mostly they're made from oil. Once you're off oil and putting nuts and seeds in the dressing, we generally give people about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds in the form of dressing or sauces or dips, or an avocado dip, a salsa dip, a, a hummus dip, or a dressing on the salad made with nuts and seeds, not made with oil, and they're usually getting about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds if they're overweight or obese. They're still getting half an ounce per meal for the, make the sauces and dressings taste good. Myself or you don't have to limit it to a half an ounce. I can eat an ounce with each meal because I'm physically more physically active. But certainly, I'm saying it makes for more satiety, and it makes for more absorption of phytochemicals, and it makes for, and when we're not snacking all day long or eating nuts between meals, because by having the fat with the meal, you're getting more benefit because you're absorbing 20 to 50 times as much of the anti-cancer phytochemicals in the vegetables you're eating when you have some fat incorporated in that meal. So you get more and more a better nutritional profile. That's really important. Yeah. So having some sort of fat with those dark leafy greens. Exactly. And you would think, look, what do the studies show? Like avocado is even more fatty than even nuts and seeds as far as the protein fat ratio. But do the studies show that avocado increases risk of diabetes, increases risk of obesity, increases risk of cardiovascular disease, raises cholesterol, raises triglycerides? No, it shows the opposite. Because it's still a whole food and because it's not absorbed as rapidly as when you have avocado, when you have oil, it's absorbed more slowly into the, into the bloodstream. And, and when you're talking about isocalorically, removing one other food and putting in avocado, you're still not gonna be hurt by the fat. But if you're eating the avocado in addition to the other calories, or you're eating nuts and seeds and snacking between meals and throwing your calories up above the level where they should be, then it's not gonna be good for your overall body fat. So it has to do with, we're having some whole food fats, but we're still doing it with the recognition that your calories have to can't go up and you can't be snacking on these foods and because they, they're calorically concentrated. Yeah, I think that's a really good tip for people because I often hear feedback. I can't put the bag of nuts down. What are they eating well, a bag case, of nuts? Use, for? What are they use the nuts as a salad topper. It's just used as part of the meal. You're not eating nuts out of, out of the bag, right? Because yeah. I could probably do that myself if yeah. if I'm watching a basketball game and right. just mindlessly. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to mindlessly eat, then eat snow pea pods or something. Don't eat right. nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Eat cherry tomatoes or something if you yeah. want to mindlessly eat because you, it's too, you don't want to eat. What's your favorite nuts? Health-wise or taste-wise? Let's go taste-wise first and then Taste-wise, I like pistachio nuts the best. Mm -hmm. Health-wise, it's walnuts and hemp seeds, mm -hmm. but they're not my most favorite taste nut, taste-wise. Mm -hmm. you know. And you'd have those most days? I have, I try to make half my nut intake to be from walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, and hemp seeds. Mostly walnuts and hemp. I have a little bit of flax and chia. And the other half of my note intake could be all the things I like for taste. Pistachio, cashews, pecans, you know, things like that. Is that to get some of those, the healthy ALA fats? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that they're healthy? This is an interesting question. So we were talking earlier about supplementing DHA and EPA. Yeah, right, right. And I think sometimes people think that the only reason you need ALA is to convert to DHA and EPA. But would you say that ALA itself is inherently important as well? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So you get benefits from those the foods and they stabilize the, myo, the myocardium, the myocytes, the heart muscle, gets the ion channels and the calcium flux all gets stabilized. All these healthy um, foods and ALA stabilizes and helps you in other ways other than the conversion of EPA and DHA. That's true. And so you also see soups as a potentially good strategy for helping reduce caloric intake as well? Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah. Do you have a favorite kind of soup? I do have my favorite kind of soup. What I like to make a soup that has a, um, a carrot juice base that has carrot juice and celery juice into the base. And then we mix in like split peas and other beans and mushrooms and onions and blended, um, you know, and spices and blended greens. And so I do make this um, soup with like a, a sweetened carrot juice base with a lot of pea, split peas that are blended into the base with a lot of onion and mushroom in there. I really love that soup. You mentioned at the beginning that it's, it's worth it just to help one person. And that's something that inspires you and has inspired you through your career. If we think about public health for a moment, because I appreciate what you're talking about is, is dealing with an individual. But if we think about the population at large here in the United States, and you mentioned before, I think 90% of people overweight or obese, it's about 40% have pre-diabetes, about 10% have type 2 diabetes, 25% have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there's been some recent success stories for sure and reduction in smoking and, and the acknowledgement or discovery of certain risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But nonetheless, uh, people are living a number of years of their life with chronic disease. Do those numbers... They must be painful. They must be painful for someone like you who understands the power of lifestyle. Those numbers must be hard to think about. Yes, we see so much needless suffering. You know, so it's it's troubling. So we're troubled by you know wars and power and you know narcissism in tendencies in humans that that fight each other and kill each other. It's very tragic to see women, humans attacking and killing each other and sacrificing their lives over nonsensical over things that we shouldn't be fighting about. And then we're also having this nutritional ignorance that's permeated the modern world that's killing people and making so much, so much unneeded suffering. And all of this is really disturbing. You know? But I guess we just got to do the best we can and feel, and feel satisfied with putting in an effort and doing what everybody, we're doing what we can to help some part, to help some part of humanity and to be passionate about making a, an impact for, the, for good, but we can't solve all the problems ourselves. Collectively, we can working together, you know? Yeah, well, you're certainly leading the way and you're doing a tremendous job. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I appreciate your time today. And I know the listeners will find this tremendously informative. So, um, Appreciate you coming down or coming up. I think you drove up. Uh, <laughs> if folks would like to connect with you to learn more about what you're doing online or, or find out a little bit more information about your books, where can we send them? The best thing is just go to my website, drfirman.com. And even at drfirman.com, I have the, um, the people can avail. There's availability of a membership where they can be able to ask me their personal questions and get some guidance from me over the internet, over a forum. So they can, if they wanted some of my input to their individual requirements or needs. But yes, I can communicate. They can come and they can learn more. They can um, look at the um, information and, and um, services I supply and um, even connect with me if they need to. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. My pleasure. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.